Today's hero is little more than a name, and indeed he may not even be that. Irsu is fifth of the eight faction leaders in Total War Pharaoh, and he pretty much single-handedly represents the Canaanite faction, or more specifically, the parts which invaded Egypt. Which means that today, we're going to need to talk about what's going on in Canaan. Why is anyone invading anyone? Why is Egypt too weak to stop it? And who does end up putting an end to all this invasion nonsense? Our story starts a few hundred years before Total War Pharaoh, in the 1500s BCE. Egypt has just come out of a century-long crisis, in which they had been invaded by a group called the Hyksos, who originated from somewhere in the Levant. Partly for revenge and partly as an expression of newfound power, the newly ascended 18th dynasty reconquered Egypt, kicked out the Hyksos, and then continued marching their armies forward into the regions of modern-day Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, roughly speaking. This region had never been unified in any significant way, and a great deal of both geographic diversity and population movements, which combined to form a culturally incredibly diverse region. Every ancient way of life was represented here, from hunter-gatherers not far off from the Stone Age all the way to maritime metropolises as well as territorial kingdoms, nomadic military bands, and peaceful folk who could transition from settled farmers to mobile herdsmen and back again as conditions warranted. It was a mixing pot of ethnicities and languages as well, none of which was respected by the invading Egyptians. We don't actually know which of these Canaanite groups was the Hyksos, largely because the Egyptians don't seem to really care or at least remember at this point. They're all kind of just Asiatics as far as the army was concerned, though the scribes, artists, and governing officials would soon become familiar with all the diversity. Everything north of the Sinai was conquered as best as the Egyptians could manage, competing eventually with the Mitanni and the Hittites for the tribes and towns of the region. The Egyptian name for all the region which was under Egyptian political control north of Sinai was Kanaan, an Egyptian rendering of a Semitic place name whose specific meaning and extent has been lost to history. The exact borders shifted as the political situation did, and it was in any case a somewhat fuzzy concept. No one thought of themselves as Canaanite primarily. There was no Canaanite nation or kingdom, and even when they were united under a strong Egypt, Egyptian control was as variable as the people under them, ruling the region town by town, tribe by tribe, rather than as a single uniform province in the way that the Romans or Persians might do so. We see this most clearly in a cache of super cool documents from the 1400s called the Amarna Letters. These are like 300 or so actual letters written by various kings and diplomats and sent to the Egyptian capital, with both vassal and enemy kings writing from around the Near East to Pharaoh Akhenaten with everything from requests for more resources to offers of tribute to diplomatic proposals. I am linking one repository of them down below if you want to read them for yourself, but one thing we see clearly is that there was no real unity here. Egyptian vassals would attack other vassals, and were constantly under threat from wandering groups. In later time periods, we even see vassal cities being swayed back to Egypt or to back the Hittites as the power across that border shifted back and forth, both in peace and in war. As we get to the later years of Ramesses the Great, however, this chaotic and difficult to manage region got increasingly unruly. Famine and foreign invasion happened to coincide with a sudden decline in the Hittites' ability to secure the northern portion of the Levant, and the Assyrians in the east got distracted by a Babylonian quagmire. Just when far more attention was required, the aging king, 
well into his 80s, appears to have been far less able to manage the colonies in Canaan, and a great deal of people slipped out of Egyptian control, some quietly and some violently. Pharaoh Merneptah led a pretty significant campaign to crack skulls and restore order after Ramesses died. This campaign was most famous for his attack on the nascent people of Israel, but while some Egyptian control would be held for nearly another century in certain areas, most of Canaan would be taken over by groups like the Philistines, the various independent cities, and various Semitic groups, possibly including early Israel. As far as we know, no significant Egyptian force entered into Canaan following Merneptah's expedition, as Senti, Amenmesa, Sipta, and Tausret each took the crown in turn and proved too busy maintaining the Nile Valley to press out past Sinai. It is in this power gap that the faction leader called Irsu appears, and here only briefly. The important thing about Irsu is that he's only one man among many, selected to be more of a representative of things that were occurring in the region more generally than for any merit of his own. We don't know where he came from, when he was born, when he died, or where he conquered. We don't even know his name. Ursu isn't actually a name, it's an epithet applied to him by his Egyptian enemies, which means something like self-made man though more here in the context of lacking a properly noble pedigree, not the positive sense that self-made man has in our own culture. The short version of his story is that during the chaos of the Bronze Age collapse, he, like many strong men, gathered around him a band of men of some description. These may have been Habiru, but Habiru itself is a complex topic, and they could well have been of a more settled origin in Irsu's case. Then they began conquering, taking wealth where they found it and carving out a small kingdom. Canaan has seen plenty of these one-man kingdoms before, and would see them again after, often controlling no more than a handful of towns and tribes, and lasting little more than a generation or two. Irsu distinguished himself by pushing into Egyptian territory, though how far and how long-lasting, how destructive this was, is all unknowable. All we really know is that he was ultimately defeated by a man named Setnacht. Now, though we know Setnacht's name, we are pretty sure it is his real name, we don't know very much about where he comes from hardly more than Irsu. He was Egyptian, that's clear, of some fairly significant rank, and likely a military man in charge of some portion of the army. Because high-ranking men in this period were frequently descendants of Ramesses the Great, it's fairly likely that he's one of many, many grandsons of the great Pharaoh. But wait, some of you have already pointed out in online discussions, Setnacht is the founder of the 20th dynasty, and Ramesses II was the greatest king of the 19th dynasty, and being different dynasties means they must have been unrelated. And I will say in general, that's a good heuristic, but in this case, the dynasty system of Egyptian history was not actually something that existed at the time. It was invented by much later Greek historians to make sense of their ancient neighbor and sort of organize their history. So-called dynasties in Egyptian history are often simply mislabeled, with men who were definitely unrelated often getting lumped together. And in this case, the opposite is happening. It's quite possible that the 19th and 20th dynasties were split up somewhat artificially. And in fact, both are often now lumped together as part of a greater Ramesside period. So-called because there will be 12 kings named Ramesses over about the next 200 years. But whether or not Setnacht was from that royal line, we hear nothing at all about his genealogy beyond a father named Sutech. We also have no idea where he was 
pretty much at any point in his life prior to reconquering Egypt. By his own account, it seems he was sitting on this couch one day, checking his Twitter feed, when he realized that things were really bad in Egypt. But fortunately, he alone, out of millions before him, came up with the one true and correct solution to all of the social ills of his nation. He started a campaign of democratization and land reforms for the good of all people. No, I'm just kidding. He started a campaign with his army to murder everyone who disagreed with him, which actually isn't quite as unique of a solution as he seems to think it was. I rather think other people had all had that idea before, but it does seem that he had the favor of the gods, or at least that's what he tells us. And as soon as he flexed his arms, all his enemies fled before him like sparrows fleeing a falcon. It seems his enemies then purchased Asiatic mercenaries, but these two were quickly defeated. The entire period is detailed in only two attestations, each about one paragraph long. Let me read you from the so-called Harris Papyrus, written a few decades later, which included in its history this period. The land of Egypt had been banished, every man being a law unto himself. They had no leader for many years previously, until other times when the land of Egypt was in the hands of chieftains and mayors. One killed his neighbor, whether high or low. Then another time came consisting of empty years, when Irsu, a Syrian, was among them as a chieftain, having made the whole land into subjection before him. Each joined with his companion in plundering their goods, and they treated the gods as they did men and no offerings were made in the temples. But the gods then inclined themselves to peace so as to put the land in its proper state in accordance with its normal condition. And they established their son, who came forth from their flesh as ruler of every land, upon their great throne, Usurhaure set penre meri amun, son of re set nachte meri re re meri amun. He was Kepriseth, when he was enraged. He set in order the entire land that has been rebellious. He killed the rebels who were in the land of Egypt. He cleansed the great throne of Egypt, being the ruler of the two lands on the throne of Atum. The account pretty much denies the legitimacy of everyone following Merneptah, and maybe also Seti II, as mere chieftains and mayors, and in the later years as no one of significance at all. There are a few different ways to sort of map here with the various uh, historical theories, but the one that the Total War people seem to be following is that right around the death of Sipta, or perhaps in year 8 of Ta'usret, Setnacht surveyed the nation saw no legitimate rulers, and declared himself Pharaoh by the will of the gods. A bit before this, Irsu had entered the nation, either covertly if, as some think, he was actually Chancellor Bey, or through force if he is his own man, as the game seems to suggest. Egypt then finds itself in a four-way battle, with Setnacht, Ta'usret, Irsu, and an assortment of small bandits, each in competition for the wreckage of a once mighty nation. The war maybe kind of takes about two years, and at the end of it, Setnacht is sufficiently powerful for his rule to be generally acknowledged throughout Egypt. At this point, Irsu either dies or retreats back into the untraceable wilderness, one more mercenary leader among many. That one mention in the one account is literally all we have for him. Everything else is conjecture and context. I would end the video at this point and read off all his titles, but whatever titles and names he may have had are lost. Now, in a sense, this makes him a fantastic faction leader for Total War Pharaoh. He is a blank slate. He can be anything you want him to be, and his presumed starting location in Canaan means he can push south into Egypt, north into Hittite lands, or stay right in the middle and build his own kingdom. 
Alternatively, they haven't yet announced playable Sea Peoples, so he could just as easily be a representation of the many, many foreign enemies coming in from basically everywhere to establish themselves as new players in the Levant. As for Setnacht, as I produce this, the Total War team has released a preview of Ramesses III, who is Setnacht's son and successor, and managed to completely fail to either show or name drop his father, the guy who really should be that faction leader in the early years. So I have no idea if he'll get any representation at all, though I have to hope that he does. His biography, though, is pretty short. Once he reunified Egypt, he'd lived for somewhere between two and four more years, probably spending most of that time establishing order and just fighting in general. Then he died of unknown causes to be succeeded by the poster boy of total war, Ramesses III. And so, just as Ursu's own conquests were overshadowed by Setnacht's conquests, so too does his episode get stolen from him at the end, as we bid farewell to Strong Bull, great of strength, image appearing like Jatjanin, powerful of arm who drives out his rebels, who smashes the nine bows who oppose the kingship, ruler of the two lands on the throne of Atum, chosen by the gods from among the millions, appearing in power like Ray, chosen of Ray, beloved of Amun, set nacht, beloved of Amun-Ra. Thank you for watching.